Welcome, one and all, to our service this morning at First Congregational Church of Houston. This is obviously not the meeting house at FCC, but one advantage of this odd time we find ourselves in is that we can have church anywhere. So I welcome you this morning from rainy and somewhat cool New Hampshire. Truly, no matter who you are or where you are, you are welcome here. I do hope and pray that although we are separated by space, we can be joined in spiritual communion this morning as we lift up our voices in prayer and praise. And now, let us sing. Now, let us pray. Holy Spirit, dwell in me that I may become a prayer. Whether I sleep or wake, eat or drink, labor or rest, may the fragrance of prayer rise without effort in my heart. Purify my soul and never leave me, so that the movements of my heart and mind may, with voices full of sweetness, sing in secret to God. Amen. Good morning. I'm Eric Barber, and our reading this morning comes from the book of Genesis chapter 28, beginning with verse 10. Jacob left Beersheba and went toward Haran. He came to a certain place and stayed there for the night, because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones of the place, he put it under his head and lay down in that place. And he dreamed that there was a ladder set upon the earth, the top of it reaching to heaven. And the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And the Lord stood beside him and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give to you and to your offspring. And your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth. And you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And all the families of the earth shall be blessed in you and in your offspring. Know that I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land, I will, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. And Jacob woke up from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. And he was afraid and said, How awesome is this place. This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. So Jacob rose early in the morning, and he took the stone that he had put under his head, and set it up for a pillar, and poured oil on top of it. And he called the place Bethel, but the name of the city was Luz at first. Here ends our reading. Welcome. So we just heard a scripture, and you might have read this Bible story with your parents at bedtime before, about Jacob and his ladder, his dream. 
So last night, did you sleep with a pillow? A stuffed animal? Jacob used a rock for a pillow. Now I'll let you know that Aaron sometimes goes to bed with a rock. on his forehead. And he uses it to say a little prayer. He doesn't know it's a prayer. He thinks about the day, what was thankful in his day, what he's grateful for. He thinks about any things that going to need help with. He does a little breathing. It's pretty effective. It gets him to sleep. Not so much a pillow. There are other people that use a rock. So here's a little poem. I'm your little prayer rock, and this is what I'll do. Just put me on your pillow until the day is through. Then turn back the covers and climb into your bed and whack, your little prayer rock will bump you on the head. And then you will remember as the day is through, to remember to say your prayers as you intended to. And then when you are finished, you can toss me on the floor and I'll stay there through the night time to give you help once more. When you get up in the morning, clunk, I'll stub your toe so that you'll remember your prayers before you go. Put me back upon your pillow when your bed is made and your clever little prayer rock will continue in your aid. So anyway, I thought that was fun. Um, we are out in Buffalo Bayou Park this morning and um, this sculpture behind me is by a, sculpt uh, a sculptor by the name of Moore. And it reminds me, his shapes remind me of dreams. So let's take a little walk around the sculpture. Mr. Moore created this in 1969. And it's called spindle. You can see it sort of like an arrow through. And he says that he based it on the Michelangelo um, painting of, of Adam and God. And so it's very dreamlike. And I wonder what the ladder to heaven looked like in Jacob's dream. So, let's end with a prayer. Loving God, be with us when we're awake. Be with us in our dreams as we sleep. Help us to remember your stories and pray always. Now let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts 
be acceptable in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Our story for today begins not with Genesis 28, but a few chapters before, because context matters. Jacob, as you might recall, was one of two brothers. There was Jacob and his slightly older twin brother, Esau. By all rights, Esau, as the older brother, was supposed to be the inheritor of the blessing that fell to Isaac, their father. But Jacob disguised himself as, a, as his older brother and duped his blind father into giving him the coveted blessing. This stealing of the sacred blessing infuriated Jacob's older brother, who vowed to kill Jacob. So when the story opens for today, Jacob had fled his home for his life. He was on his way to his relatives in far off Haran, present day Iraq. Tired from the journey and the spiritual angst that tortured him, Jacob knew he needed rest. Using a nearby stone as a pillow, Jacob falls asleep, and then he has a dream, the dream we read about in our text for this morning. Dreams have an interesting history in the religious world. For thousands of years, they've been interpreted as windows into the mind of God. How did God speak? More than likely in a dream. Ancient prophets interpreted dreams, theirs and others, to help political leaders make decisions. Remember the story of Joseph and Pharaoh? Joseph gains favor with Pharaoh through his ability to interpret dreams. In the book of Daniel, Daniel interprets the dreams of Nebuchadnezzar. These stories were not unusual. In societies all over the globe, dreams have had special interpretive weight. Constantine the Great, the Emperor of Rome, famously had a dream before the pivotal Battle of Milvian Bridge in 312 AD. The night before the battle, Constantine saw in his dream the Cairo, the first two letters in Greek of the word Christ which had been used as a Christian symbol. He heard the words, in hoc signo win case, under this sign you will conquer. The next day, Constantine painted the Cairo and the shields of his, of his soldiers and won the battle. Afterwards, Constantine became a Christian, or at least a Christian in name. Dreams have power. In the modern era, Sigmund Freud did more to lift up the power of dreams than anyone else. Freud argued that all humans have a subconscious, thoughts, motivations, and feelings that affect us deeply, but about which we are unaware. Why does someone act against his or her self-interest? The subconscious. Why do people have psychological issues, such as stress or anxiety? Because of the conflict between the subconscious and our egos, that sense of self we have in our conscious minds and that is restrained by the expectations of society. The way we find healing and wholeness and psychological health, according to Freud, is to become aware of our subconscious wants and desires. By naming our emotions and conflicting thoughts that lie beneath the surface of our conscious mind, we can address that underlying turmoil. We can begin to reconcile different aspects of ourselves. But how do we get to the subconscious? How can we figure out what lies beneath? For Sigmund Freud, dreams provided the ideal window to the subconscious. Dreams represented our deepest desires and dreams employed images from our life to reflect those deepest desires. Freud, and many psychoanalysts after him, argued that dreams, interpreted properly, could give analysts insight they needed in their sessions with patients. Dreams held the key to our subconscious and our growth psychologically. While many have critiqued Freud's theories since he first put them forward in 1900, his view on dreams as windows into the subconscious is still widely accepted by people. Take the practice of keeping a dream journal. I know a number of friends who have kept dream journals. The problem with our dreams is that we tend to forget them not long after waking up. In order to remember dreams, people keep a notepad by their bed. When they wake up from a dream, even if it's in the middle of the night, these people turn on the light and write down every detail they can remember from their dream. Supposedly, not only does this give you a catalog of your dreams, but it helps us remember more dreams more vividly. Are there any dreams that you remember? Have you ever tried a dream journal? Was there some recurring dream that kept haunting you? How about, have you ever tried interpreting a dream? Dreaming doesn't always happen at night. We also use dreaming to refer to the use of our imaginations when awake or nearly awake. Although it might be called daydreaming, these daydreams can also speak to what's going on in our subconscious, or at least those parts of our consciousness that speak to deep desires. If dreams can give us answers to resolve our inner conflicts, then daydreams might be able to speak to those inner desires as well. Most of us have read The Secret Life of Walter Mitty, 
that iconic short story that focuses on the daydreaming title character. What makes that story compelling is that we can see ourselves in Walter Mitty, almost as though our own secret has been found out. Daydreaming is a part of who we are, some of us more than others. I, for one, get lost in my imagination all the time. When I go to the gym, or at least used to before coronavirus, and I saw some sports contest on the television screens, I couldn't help but go into this narrative where, say, I'm the star quarterback. I've got all the details of my pro career worked out. While John, the professional quarterback, might, have, might not have the arm strength or speed of some other quarterbacks, QB John more than makes up for it as an on-the-field tactician. QB John has an almost preternatural ability to find the open receiver, to make that key third down play, to scramble away from bigger and faster D linemen. Scrappy. And somehow professional QB John always seems to win the big game in the last minute. Funny how that works. There are lots of other aspects to this off-repeated daydream sequence, but I'll spare you the details. But some part of my brain wants me to be the unlikely hero, the underdog. I'm not the water boy in my daydream. I'm the star QB. And I have struggles to go through and endure. That's part of the dream, those struggles. But I win out in the end. Go John. It's not hard to be a, psycho uh, to be a pop psychologist for that one. The question I'm curious about, though, is which dreams of any sort you might have had when you were in a situation like Jacob's, when your life was at a crossroads. Have you ever had a situation when a dream led you to a new direction in life? or confirmed a direction you were already on? I'm sure you've heard these stories, those stories of individuals who have a dream about a plane crashing the night before they're supposed to fly. They miss their flight, and then the plane crashes. Cue eerie music in the background. But a dream of any sort doesn't have to be life-saving to be life-changing. When I was in middle school, I used to take our dog for a walk every evening between 8.30 and 9 p.m. I'd go on the same one-mile loop near the house where I grew up. When I went on these walks, I would put a mixtape, expertly put together by yours truly, in my Walkman, and then put on my headphones for my stroll. I loved those walks and the places they took me in my mind. You see, the music would help me get into a place, an emotional place of real and potent dreaming. The subject of my dreaming while walking varied, but they helped me process whatever I was going through at the time. I would be transported a la Walter Mitty, floating on the sounds of my mixtape. There was one particular time in my mind when my mind took an unexpected journey. I was walking by the Halloran's house just down the street, and, seemingly out of nowhere, I had my whole life flash before me. I can't remember now what I was dreaming about when this flash of something, was it revelation, came into my mind, but the vision, the dream, was vivid as can be. It was alive real. I saw myself self taking the path in life that my father wanted me to, going to an elite college and then working as an investment banker on Wall Street, putting in a hundred hours per week, year after year. I saw myself doing the work reasonably well, but being utterly miserable. I had no direction, no purpose, just life at the office and listening to others about what I was supposed to do. My life, as it flashed before me that night in eighth grade, had little meaning. I was lost. The vision shook me because I knew how real it could be. Now, this is not to say, of course, that all investment bankers are miserable in their jobs or their lives. Far from it. After all, my older brother is an investment banker and quite happy in his job. But it showed to me that that, 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 that was not the path that I should be on. That dream, that vision, had a profound impact on my life. I could never quite shake it. And while I did become an investment banker later for a short time, I knew it was not the career for me. I was someone who needed to be passionately and spiritually involved in my work. That was not going to happen for me in a career in finance. I felt I needed to spend my life exploring life's meaning, looking for truth, trying to find God. I didn't know at the time that that would lead me to do what I'm doing now, but I knew it had to be something like it. That dream, that dream that day made me see that. How about you? Are there key moments? Are there any key moments when a dream sends you in a new direction? Think of those nudges, those manifestations of your deepest desires. How did they appear in your life? What happened? I bring this up because we all have various conflicting patterns in our lives. We all find ourselves at one time or another in Jacob's shoes. Our decisions, at least our big ones, 
are rarely clear-cut. Doubts constantly creep into our minds. Those doubts might concern your marriage. Five years later, you might ask, find yourself asking, did I do the right thing? You could ask the same thing about your job. You make the decision to follow your passion and become a teacher. Then years later, you wonder if it was the right move. The same thing holds true for the engineer at an oil company or bartender at a local watering hole. Could I have made different choices? It's so easy in life to second guess ourselves because there are pressures and influences from all over that lead us to second guess things. This is where social media can only magnify our doubts. We see images of people having fun, going on trips with their happy families, and we wonder as we look around, did I do the right thing? I'm sure these doubts continue to nag Jacob, even after his dream at Bethel. After he awoke, Jacob left Bethel and traveled to Haran. There, he met Laban and had to work for seven years to win his daughter in marriage. Then, ironically, it was Jacob who gets tricked to marry Laban's other daughter, Leah, and then has to work another seven years to win the hand of Rachel. How many times during that stretch do you think that Jacob would have questioned his choices? I'm sure there were many nights when he asked himself if he had been wrong to cheat his brother out of his birthright and blessing. Would Jacob be happier if he, was, if he were back with Isaac? Would he have thrived there just as easily? What if? What if? Last year in one of my sermons, I mentioned a book by Parker Palmer entitled, Let Your Life Speak. In that book, Palmer addressed this very question. He asked people to look back at their earlier years. What were the things that inspired you and moved you when you were younger? Have you followed those dreams of your youth? What has become of them? For Palmer, the key to finding our vocation is to return to those dreams of our youth because it's in there, because it's in those where we find something of our true selves. We can't help but be buffeted by various pressures and concerns when we get older. We might find ourselves second guessing one aspect of our lives or another. Sometimes these periods can lead us, sometimes these moments can lead us to a period of deep questioning and consternation. Then it helps to look back. Look back when you were younger, when some of the pressures of the world were not quite so potent. What were your dreams then? How did your subconscious thoughts and emotions manifest themselves in your dreaming, both at night and during the day? Do you remember how that felt? How it structured your thinking? In Jacob's dream in Genesis 28, he sees heaven opening up and a stairway leading from earth to heaven with angels walking up and down. There was at that spot a shrinking of the space between heaven and earth. It was a reminder that this world, this world we inhabit is infused with the presence of God and her angels. But then God appears next to Jacob and speaks to him. God assures Jacob of the same promise that he had given to his father and his father, fa father's father before him. God would bless Jacob and his descendants. It would happen. God was there. I do wonder how many times Jacob returned to that vision while he was toying for Laban those 14 years. When the various pressures of his life, including those that might have kept him in Haran instead of returning to Palestine, kept creeping, in, kept creeping in and clouding his vision, what did Jacob think? I imagine he returned to that early vision. He reminded himself how profound it was, that dream. There he had met God, and it transformed him. The reality is that there's far less difference between the classical interpretation of dreams and the Freudian interpretation than we might imagine. Both of those frameworks speak to that, that which gives us life and moves within us. For Freud, the subconscious is truly what drives us. The subconscious is where our deepest desires and wants and purposes lie. For us to be healthy and thriving, we should be aware of our subconscious desires and where they come from. It is that awareness that leads us to equanimity in life. In much the same way, religious people see God as the wellspring of our souls. God calls us to certain actions and on certain paths. God has created us and is creating us in particular ways. Those ways are not always clear amidst the noise of society, but dreams, according to the ancients, dreams can open up a window to God, which can quiet our restlessness, grant us peace and wholeness, and lead us on a path to love. What are those dreams 
that keep recurring in your life? What are those dreams that shaped your life in the past? What are the dreams of God for you now? So often this gets clouded by the pressures of our contemporary world, but can we remind ourselves of our dreams? This time of coronavirus is difficult for so many. It is not a happy time, but it is a time when we have the chance for reflection. People aren't traveling to exotic places. We're spending time with our family and our closest friends. This gives us an opportunity to tune out some of the pressures we might feel at different times. It also gives us that precious gift of time for reflection. When in your life did you awake and realize you were on sacred ground? Where was it? What was that dream? I'm grateful myself for the time away. My vacation starts this week. Already I've been thinking back on things as I'm surrounded by family in a place that is so familiar to me. It's made me recall my dreams and to be grateful for the path that my life has taken. I remember that dream from eighth grade and I'm happy I listened to it. After Jacob awoke, he built an altar to God and anointed it with oil so that every time he thought of that place and every time he passed by it, he was reminded of God's words and how they shaped his life. Can we do that now? Can we use this time? Might God be calling us to use this time? Dreams sometimes open up new worlds to us. Sometimes heaven does come very close. Sometimes we look around and see angels and, and we realize what being home with God really is. And now let us pray. A traditional prayer of Breton fishermen. Dear God, be good to me. The sea is so large and my boat is so small. Amen. And let us pray to and let us pray for the confidence to find God within. When I feel threatened or believe myself to be a failure, give me the courage to enter my still center that place of buried treasure and sunshine and solitude where you are, Lord, and where it no longer matters who approves of me or how successful I am, because you are there, and in your presence, I rediscover the confidence to be me. Amen. And let us pray for the commitment to follow God in hope. O oh God, you promise a world where those who now weep shall laugh those who are hungry shall feast. Those who are poor now and excluded shall have your kingdom for their own. I want this world too. I renounce despair. 
I will act for change. I choose to be included in your great feast of life. Amen. And now let's pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Creator, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. My name is Carlene Jerk. I am your mission moment. This is your mission moment. I am your ma'am, liaison person. So today I'm going to begin the back to school program or drive for ma'am, which is Memorial Assistance Ministries. For those of you new to our church, this drive is over 30 years old. It can affects over 6,000 students and either in either of three school districts, Spring Branch, HISD, and Aldine. And although we don't know exactly what school will look like in the fall, we do know that it, there will be a need to help those affected families. The children are all chosen by their teachers or counselors. And $50 will buy a uniform, shoes, underwear, and a belt. And $100, of course, helps two children. Parents will receive a voucher for $50, and they go with their, ch their child to pick out their uniform at, at the store. You may send a check with your donation to the church office with back to school on the memo line, or you can give online by following the directions that are printed in the bulletin. We're setting a goal of $3,000, excuse me, and hope that we reach or exceed it. Everyone has always been very generous at this church about back to school, and I expect no less. Stay safe. Good morning. I am Joe James, and we are now to the time of offering in our service. I would like to ask you to reflect upon all of the great things that God has done in your life and all of the wonderful work that is being done by the congregation here. I would like to invite you to consider a donation to the life of our congregation. You may give electronically through the website, via text, or via Zelle. Zelle is the preferred method of electronic giving and is available through most major banking apps. Instructions on how to donate may be found in your bulletin. <laughs>
now receive this blessing. May Christ's holy, healing, enabling spirit be with you every step of the way and be your guide as your road changes and turns. And the blessing of God, our creator, redeemer, and giver of life be with you always. Amen. Amen.